1985, the USSR, under the leadership of Mikhail Gorbachev, embarked on perestroika, a policy of reforms which would gradually result in the collapse of the Soviet bloc. In 1989, the winds of freedom also blew across East Germany. We'll revisit this period through photos taken by an East German, Wolfgang Thomas. Back then, he lived in Berlin, a city cut in half by a wall since 1961. As a little kid, I dreamed of owning an electric train set. For my 10th birthday, my dad got me one. I was overjoyed. This love of trains has never left me. And years later, I became a railway worker. My wife, Ingrid, shares the same passion for travel. Today, it's my son, Martin, who plays with his electric train set. I hope that one day he'll be able to travel freely around the world. He dreams of seeing the Eiffel Tower. And back in the early summer of 1989, this was a pipe dream. When we get to the station, Martin asks me if we'll see the sea. He poses proudly in front of our railroad car. I feel like I'm seeing myself at his age. Every year, Ingrid, Martin and I go on vacation in a brother country. This year, we're off to Romania. Yesterday, I told Martin the story of Dracula. After six hours on the train, Martin wakes up with a start. He says he dreamed a vampire was after him. Maybe I should have kept Dracula to myself. We finally reach Shiznadji, at the foot of the mountains. I stroll around this outdated village with my camera. The Romanians look at me in the same way that I look at West Germans when they visit East Berlin. They see me as privileged coming from the GDR, a freer and wealthier country than theirs is. Like back home, slogans glorifying the regime appear on every street corner. On August 15th, Ingrid, Martin, and I set off for a hike in the mountains. When we get to the mountain hut, a guy tells us something crazy. He claims that the border between Hungary and Austria is open and that hundreds of East German tourists are entering the West without being stopped. Ingrid looks skywards and says, I don't believe it for a minute. Two days later, we're on the coast of the Black Sea. In his Donald Duck t-shirt, Martin looks just like an American kid. The GDR seems so far away. 
For the past year, things have been tense, and surveillance has stepped up a gear. Here, we can finally breathe. Back at the train station, we talk about the guy we met in the mountains. Apparently, we too could have fled. In late summer of 1989, the Hungarian government officially opened its border with Austria. Over three weeks under the pretext of vacationing in Hungary, several thousand GDR citizens passed into the West. On August 29th, Martin starts his new school year, while Ingrid and I go back to work. For two weeks every month, I'm away working on site. All my co-workers and I talk about is the appointment of Edward Geyer as coach of the East German national soccer team. Will he manage to qualify us for the next World Cup? In truth, nobody cares that much. We're all thinking about the ongoing events, even if none of us dares talk about them. A misplaced word, a wrongly interpreted phrase. And you're in trouble. You never know who's listening. The Stasi is everywhere. I've set up my darkroom in the kitchen. Once Ingrid and Martin are in bed, I switch on my red lamp. I can't help thinking of the words to that Nina Hagen song. Back then, I was 20 and had long hair. Even in black and white, they're happy memories. And then in 1976, Nina Hagen went over to the West. This is Martin in his mom's tummy. And there he is at seven months. Everyone says he's the spitting image of me. He's 10 now. I wasn't much older when my dad vanished. In 1956, he fled to the West. I've never forgiven him. From then on, my brother Roland and I were suspects at school, in the sports club, everywhere. In 1979, my brother left too. Today, all mom has left here is me. Of course, we can't stand Honecker speeches and Stasi surveillance anymore, but when my best friend Christian tells me he has permission to go to the West, I'm flabbergasted. I'm happy for him, but Martin's sad. He's in love with Christian's daughter, Cindy. They invite our group of friends to celebrate their departure some party. On the station platform, the mood is a bit down. Christian's wife seems happy, but he looks a bit apprehensive. He's just admitted to being scared of not being able to adapt to life in the West. I try to reassure him. Then we go home and put Martin to bed. Ingrid says to me, 
If everyone leaves, what will become of our country? On October the 2nd, Gethsemane Church in East Berlin became a hotbed of protest. Demonstrators were claiming more freedom and democracy. Across the country, Protestant pastors backed ever-growing non-violent gatherings. For the past few days, Ingrid has spent her evenings at Gethsemane Church. She keeps telling me, instead of hiding behind your lens, do something here. After school, Martin shows me his poetry book. Frieden ist schön, peace is beautiful. Peace is so beautiful that kids can keep going to school while their parents continue to work hard. Peace is beautiful. Martin is growing up in an absurd world. All he hears are empty phrases and stupid slogans. The latest from Comrade Honecker himself. Always forwards, never backwards. As the guest of honor at the GDR's 40th anniversary celebrations, Mikhail Gorbachev arrived in East Berlin on October the 6th, 1989. The country was on the verge of imploding. The regime tried to hide it. That night, 10,000 Communist Party members joined a torch-lit parade before Erich Honecker and his guests. October 6th, my birthday and that of East Germany. I'm 43. The GDR is 40. At around 11 p.m., I hear shouting and police sirens. My friends and I go down onto the street to check it out. Damn it, I've forgotten my camera. The police tell us to keep moving, brutally shoving us. Suddenly, the guy next to me is being beaten up by another guy. I punch him in the face with all I've got. It turns out it's a Stasi agent. Guys in civilian clothes jump on me, drag me away, and throw me in the back of a truck. My first thought is I'll be spending the rest of my life in Siberia. Inside the truck, everyone is terrified. On October the 7th, through the windows of the Palace of the Republic, party officials watch protesters gathering. The crowd began to chant the name of the Soviet leader. Honecker paled. He already knew the USSR would abandon him. I'm released after 24 hours. For the next few days, I'm scared. The Stasi could come back at any moment, search the house, do what they like with me. Ingrid tries everything to reassure me. I take out my enlarger and try to forget it all. I met Ingrid on New Year's Eve, 1977. At the time, a lot of people still believed in the tomorrows they sung along to. Socialism would bring happiness to the whole of mankind, and especially to us. On 
On October the 18th, 1989, Honecker was removed from office by the Politburo. He was replaced by Egon Krenz, the first person to use the term vendor, the turning point. The regime showed its first signs of change, albeit relative. On November the 4th, Berlin would see its biggest ever protest march. We arranged to meet up with friends for the march. Ingrid goes off with them while I stay with Martin. The TV was showing all the banners and the slogans chanted by the crowd. Live, the atmosphere is electric, the city center total mayhem. I can't believe my eyes. Suddenly, I come face to face with two Stasi guys. I take the picture. I'm not scared anymore. I take photo after photo. I realized that after this, there's no going back. November 9, 1989. I'll never forget that date. I was over near Dresden working on the track. That evening, we grab some beers and switch on the portable TV set. Comrade Shabovsky of the Politburo was talking about freedom of movement. We all look at each other, dumbfounded. Never did I imagine it happening like this, so swiftly. In the middle of the night, I finally managed to get hold of Ingrid. She sounds drunk. Her speech is slurred. She tells me that people are singing and dancing on the streets and drinking champagne. The border was opened. A vast crowd gathered before the Brandenburg Gate. Berlin had been split in two since April the 13th, 1961. A new chapter in German history was about to begin. On the train ride home, I think, the wall has fallen and I wasn't even there to see it. Ingrid will blame it on my job again. I'm never there when I need to be. Before going home, I stop off at the wall. I can't believe my eyes. Everything looks so unreal through the lens. The three of us jump in the Trabant and drive to Tegel Airport. I want to show Martin what a Western airport looks like and to open a can of Coca-Cola. We spend hours watching planes take off and reading the names of the world's capitals we could only dream of before. London, Hong Kong, Paris. And I say, this summer, we're going to Paris. On November the 28th, Chancellor Helmut Kohl revealed his government's plan to reunify the two Germanys. In reaction, East German artists and intellectuals launched the Für unser Land appeal for our country, which wanted freedom, but also to maintain a state independent of West Germany. There were rapidly more than a million signatories. 
On December the 3rd, a crowd of East Germans took to the streets, each carrying a candle. Wir sind das Volk. We are the people. Martin and Ingrid strike a pose. As I photograph this incredible scene, I start humming John Lennon's Imagine. All these dreamers holding hands. We want freedom, but we don't want to see the GDR disappear, swallowed up by West Germany. We still believe. We see in the new year with Christian and his family. We never expected to see each other so soon. They've adapted well to their new life. He's still a railway worker, but in the West, if that term means anything anymore. We go out for a walk and inevitably end up next to the wall. Martin takes his first photos. It's crazy. Being able to go from one side to the other so freely still seems unbelievable to us. My dad pays us a visit with his new wife. Elections were held in the GDR on March the 18th, 1990 the first free elections in the country since 1933. They were won by supporters of reunification. Lothar de Maizière, leader of the Christian Democrats, became the head of the East German government. His assistant was a certain Angela Merkel. We lost the election, but at last we're free. On July 15, 1990, we set off for Paris with a couple of friends in two Trabants. We're greeted everywhere like heroes. We symbolize freedom. Once in Paris, we drive the wrong way up a one-way street. Nobody complains. A policeman even shouts out, Trabants, and he lets us through. Everything seems so wonderful. The metro, the crowds, the store windows, the advertising. Everything is so new. At the Gare de Lyon, I tell a train driver, I'm an East German railway man, and Martin and I suddenly find ourselves in the cab of a TGV. It's the most beautiful train I've ever seen. After the fall of the Berlin Wall, on October the 3rd, 1990, the two Germanys became one. Wolfgang witnessed the disappearance of his homeland, the GDR. A page in world history turned before the incredulous eyes of millions of men and women like Wolfgang and Ingrid. Back then, I felt as if events had overtaken me. Everything happened so fast. I remember having to compare prices, deal with our rent increases, making our tax declarations. All of that was pretty difficult. Martin and Ingrid adapted quickly. As for me, I'm a bit naive and not so smart.
Just after the two Germanys united, Ingrid and Wolfgang divorced. Martin became a musician and now travels freely all over the world. <laughs> 